It's a great pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the Center for Ethics and Science and Technology, KBBS and UCSD TV for inviting me to come and speak about the current antibiotic resistance crisis and some of the ethical challenges it poses and some innovative solutions on the horizon. The goal of these introductory slides is threefold. I wanna give a brief overview of the origin and the magnitude of the antibiotic resistance problem. Then I will uh, list uh, for our subsequent discussion some ethical dilemmas that are raised by the resistance crisis. And finally, very briefly let you know that we're pursuing some innovative solutions to this crisis right here at UC San Diego. So antibiotics are a wonder drug class, perhaps the most important in the history of medicine. You can see from this graph that after antibiotics were introduced right around World War II, uh, deaths declined dramatically in the human population and really uh, exceed the gain in uh, uh, life savings from all other medical technologies combined since then. But we've reached an era of declining antibiotic discovery. There is a discovery void in the last several decades after a heyday of antibiotic discovery. And there's two major things contributing to this. First is economic. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are businesses and they don't view antibiotics as a particularly profitable area because you only treat the patient for a few weeks in contrast to a chronic drug you might give for diabetes or hypertension. Plus the very issue of resistance that we'll be discussing uh, means that your drug could lose its effectiveness and therefore market uh, after um, uh, enough bacteria evolve resistance. And the second one is a void of innovative ideas. Most antibiotic uh, development has focused on uh, reinventing uh, the same wheel, um, chemical antibiotics screened in test tubes for their ability to kill or suppress the growth of bacteria and it looks like that's an area of tremendously diminishing returns. Antibiotic resistance each year in the United States is responsible for at least 3 million infections, 50,000 deaths, 8 million hospital days, and 300 billion in hospital costs. Globally, because antibiotic resistance and infection-associated disease disproportionately affect the developing world, there are probably 700,000 deaths due to antimicrobial resistance annually. But on our current trajectory, this might reach 10 million deaths a year by 2050, at which point deaths due to superbugs would exceed human cancer as a cause of uh, illness and death. Uh, this crisis has gained the attention of a lot of uh, government agencies and advocacy groups, uh, including uh, the U.S. government uh, initiated during the Obama administration, a national action plan to try to preserve antibiotics and their utility, many efforts on the World Health Organization to stave off a post-antibiotic era, uh, which would greatly compromise the practice of modern medicine as we know it, the United Nations, which actually convened its General Assembly for only the second time, the first time uh, being the HIV pandemic, uh, on a health issue, uh, stating that antibiotic resistance is a fundamental threat to global health and safety. And some of the most concerning estimates have been the loss in global productivity uh, due to unrestricted antibiotic resistance growth could 
cost the global economy as much as $100 trillion, really hard to fathom. The causes of antibiotic resistance are multifold. Uh, antibiotics are uh, dramatically overprescribed. Uh, probably at least a third of antibiotic courses uh, were not really necessary. And in many parts of the world, uh, antibiotics can be obtained without a doctor just going directly to uh, a pharmacy and purchasing them. Obviously, that could lead to further uh, uh, misuse. Uh, patients are inconsistent in their completion of treatment. So bacteria might be partially treated, gain some resistance, but not be cleared. Interestingly, over half the antibiotics are administered not in human healthcare setting, but in agricultural settings, uh, such as livestock husbandry. And uh, that uh, antibiotic uh, exposure leads to resistant organisms that can find their way into human medicine. In parts of the world with uh, poor hygiene and sanitation or underfunded health systems, uh, infection control practices in the hospital uh, can fall short and infections can spread uh, from patient to patient. And there is a lack of new antibiotics being uh, developed. What are some of the organisms that we're most uh, concerned about? Many of you have heard of MRSA. Uh, this is a uh, common bacterial infection of uh, the skin, can infect any age group, uh, both people with medical problems and those that are previously healthy, like this uh, young child. And uh, these are one of the most common causes of bloodstream infections and really abscesses in any part of the body, very difficult to treat. Tuberculosis is multidrug resistant in the developing world, but really not so uncommon here in San Diego because uh, of a lot of tuberculosis uh, just across the border uh, and in immigrant populations. Um, there are extremely drug resistant strains of this chronic debilitating and difficult to treat disease. Really common in American hospitals are uh, infections with drug-resistant gram-negative uh, bacteria, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, which can cause uh, infections in ICUs, in cancer patients, and in the cystic fibrosis population, certain strains resistant to all the common antibiotics that we have. There's a big class of bacteria known as Enterobacteriaceae that have become resistant to the last-line antibiotics known as carbapenem. So these CREs uh, can cause outbreaks of very difficult to treat diseases. There was within our UC system a superbug outbreak that caused a number of deaths uh, associated with um, medical procedures uh, of the gastrointestinal tract up at UCLA several years ago. Many people have heard of C. diff, not so much an antibiotic resistant bacteria, but a very difficult to treat bacteria that emerges when your uh, normal microbiome is damaged by too many courses of antibiotics. And this bacteria produces a toxin that can damage uh, the lining of the gut. And finally, in the news recently, you've heard of drug-resistant gonorrhea, one of the most important sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, and these strains are uh, very dangerous, uh, very likely to recur, and of course, highly contagious. And uh, their uh, problematic nature was uh, foreseen uh, by our recent ex-president many, many years ago. So antibiotic resistance occurs uh, when uh, a large number of bacteria, remember when you have a bacterial infection, it's not a single microbe, it's literally uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of microbes on a microscopic level in your body are exposed to the antibiotics. Uh, the majority of them can be killed, but because of random mutations, some of those mutations may change the bacteria such that it's no longer susceptible to the antibiotics. And because of their rapid replication cycle, really 20 to 30 minutes, the resistant ones can proliferate 
and the genes that encode this antibiotic resistance can spread from bacteria to bacteria, both within the patient, but also in the environment. I'm gonna show you a little movie here which demonstrates that antibiotic resistance uh, is uh, really Darwinian evolution right before your eyes. This is like a football field of antibiotic uh, with increasing concentrations as you get to the center. The dose of antibiotics in the center is a thousand times that which would normally kill the bacteria. In this case, an E. coli is going to be uh, introduced into the two end zones. And you can see uh, that uh, the growth of the bacteria uh, uh, will occur only in the area where there is no antibiotics at the outset, and they'll come up to the edge of the first level of antibiotic, a dose of one, and suddenly you'll see individual mutants emerge that can spread into the next level of antibiotic, but they're slowly training themselves such that when they encounter the tenfold step up again, uh, they're inhibited, but individual mutants can break through. And this is an experiment uh, that has been sped up, but is really occurring only over a 10-day course. Uh, and uh, you can see that the, the bacteria have trained themselves to be resistant to a thousand-fold the concentration, ultimately, of antibiotic uh, that once uh, killed them. And a 10-day course of antibiotics might be uh, normal for what would be uh, used in uh, treatment of a common uh, infection, uh, like a kidney infection or a pneumonia. I think uh, for the purposes of our subsequent discussion, uh, there's many ethical uh, areas uh, which I want to bring up, uh, throw out there for you to ponder, and maybe individuals will have questions uh, that Michael and I can discuss in more detail. So um, there is an inherent ethical uh, conflict uh, between patient autonomy, uh, meaning uh, the potential interests of the individual patient, and infection control measures that are put in place uh, to protect others. You might argue, why don't we just do everything possible, throw every antibiotic at this one patient to cure the infection, but the more antibiotic exposure, not only to the bacteria that is causing the infection, but all the other microbes uh, in that patient's body and on their, um, in their immediate environment uh, could evolve resistance and then spread to other individuals uh, that are at higher risk of infection, maybe because of their extremes of age or uh, immunosuppression or underlying medical conditions. Um, also, you might uh, ask, uh, is it ethical to report patients that have contagious bacterial infections? Uh, does their privacy uh, preclude that? And of course, if we maintain that privacy, uh, are other individuals who might be exposed to this dangerous drug-resistant infection by close contact uh, with the infected individual maintaining autonomy, uh, are they uh, being treated fairly? And finally, the increased costs and longer hospital stay, uh, as highlighted, of antimicrobial resistance suffering patients uh, strain uh, existing hospitals with limited resources, and that leads to conflict in allocation of scarce resources uh, among all the different needy patient populations. Antibiotic resistance is a global uh, problem, and that creates uh, ethical challenges related to the fair distribution of global resources. Uh, since uh, low- and middle-income countries are disproportionately affected, uh, antimicrobial resistance and its uh, poor outcomes widen the discrepancies in health outcomes uh, between uh, these regions across the globe. Also, countries with uh, 
uh, weak healthcare systems are less likely to be able to address antimicrobial resistance all by themselves. And the question is, can we provide the degree of international assistance and capacity building to which uh, they are entitled? And remember, it might be wise uh, to do so because at, this is a, a very mobile world and we know that uh, resistant infections that develop even in a faraway uh, land uh, can ultimately find themselves uh, to our communities. And uh, another interesting thing to ponder is though we are seeking overall to lower antibiotic usage to um, uh, reduce the selection for antibiotic resistance, it is still far, far more common for people to die from utter lack of access to high quality antibiotics in low income countries than they are to die from antimicrobial resistant infections in high income countries. So on a pure uh, life-saving basis, wider access of antibiotics uh, would probably save lives given this basic fact. The widespread use of antibiotics in agriculture also uh, create some interesting ethical uh, questions. Um, great reductions in antibiotic exposure could be achieved uh, in this domain, but what about animal welfare? If you took entire classes of antibiotics and said they are reserved only for human use, then perhaps certain treatable infections would no longer be cured in the veterinary settings. Also, our current modes of food production, which include a lot of intensive agriculture where animals are uh, crowded and every effort is made to grow them quickly to market size. This is also quite true in aquaculture uh, settings uh, for seafood. Um, uh, prophylactic use of antibiotics is needed to compensate for the crowding farming uh, conditions. Uh, remember that uh, crowding is a major source of risk of infection spread. So if you're gonna do intensive agriculture because we feel we need this to meet uh, the uh, food demands of the ever expanding human population, then uh, antibiotics have to date been one of the ways that we achieve that. And then very interesting, and this is something that's shared with other um, dilemmas, uh, for example, um, the um, debt, uh, the national debt uh, that we can spend money now, but that would be incurred uh, for future generations to pay back, or certainly global warming and our use of fossil fuels today might uh, create uh, climate conditions uh, in the future that have a devastating impact on uh, later generations, uh, use of precious water resources, etc. There are these ethical challenges of intragenerational, meaning, you know, right now, uh, versus intergenerational uh, justice uh, posed by antibiotics. With their decreasing in, uh, effectiveness, an ethical conflict emerges uh, for their fair distribution across generations. So how should we allocate this increasingly scarce public good? Is it fair that we um, leave no stone unturned in our current generation uh, which could leave future generations without effective antibiotics. So antibiotics uh, are uh, considered a non-renewable resource in a sense that is currently being depleted at a very worrying rate. And a patient's individual interest in receiving as many different potentially effective antibiotics right now may be at odds with preserving a subset of those as effective antibiotics for the future. 
And for these reasons, uh, the ethics of antibiotic resistance are often described as a collective uh, action problem. Uh, the benefits uh, can be largely internalized uh, to the individual patient, where most of the costs in the scheme of antibiotic resistance are uh, externalities that are borne by the society as a whole. And it's only when we uh, change our practices to a sufficient degree that we can see the benefits. Just like with a vaccine, um, there's not much benefit on the public health uh, if only a very small uh, proportion of individuals are vaccinated and herd immunity is not achieved. The same thing, we can only preserve antibiotics if uh, the best practices are extended uh, to a large number of practitioners and uh, medical environments across the world. There are some exceptions to the collective act action principle, um, you could argue that reducing the risk of a very highly contagious infection with antibiotic treatment, of course, benefits the broader uh, population, even in the short term. So people often look at a decision-making matrix on antibiotic prescription uh, that is based on minimizing the risk. And there's a number of different risks you can think of. Uh, one would be to have a poor outcome from the infection. If your options are no treatment, the very best antibiotic treatment, or some inferior or suboptimal treatment, uh, you could see that the optimal treatment uh, would have no risk of a bad outcome, but not treating the infection or suboptimally treating the infection would have a risk of a bad outcome. In terms of a reaction to the antibiotic itself, um, those are pretty uncommon, but there are some side effects like uh, allergic reactions or uh, liver toxicity to certain antibiotics. Uh, you could note that that's really uh, going to uh, occur when you have um, optimal uh, 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 treatment and be worst with suboptimal treatment if you're not using uh, the safest, most active antibiotics. But no treatment doesn't bring that drug risk. Uh, resistance is worse uh, when you're treating with uh, suboptimal antibiotics because you only achieve partial treatment and the bacteria can evolve uh, resistance but there's always a risk whenever antibiotics are exposed of resistance. And uh, of course, antibiotic treatment costs something, whereas no treatment doesn't cost anything. So it's really in this uh, area that you can see that suboptimal treatment or poor antibiotic practice is a worst case scenario. Uh, everything is bad, uh, but you're trying to balance between uh, withholding treatment in some cases acknowledging that there's some risk of the infection not going away on its own uh, versus optimal treatment, which has some risk of resistance and uh, costs more. And that's really where the balance is. But this concept that optimal treatment has no risk is changing a little bit. And that's because there's a greater understanding of the importance of your healthy microbiome uh, to uh, our well-being. And uh, antibiotics, of course, not only uh, uh, act against the bacteria causing the infection, uh, which is being targeted, but also have collateral damage, or we call friendly fire, on our normal microbiome. And this can be depleted over time. And many scholars, uh, such as Marty Blazer in this book, Missing Microbes, are pointing out that uh, we are, uh, by laying waste with too much antibiotic uh, prescription uh, to our normal flora, incurring a wide variety of potential problems. Uh, we know that uh, the microbiome helps as a first barrier against pathogen invasion. Uh, the good bacteria are occupying all the real estate 
if you knock them out, a pathogen can get a foothold and you would have increased susceptibility to infection. Your immune system works in cooperation, uh, kind of trains on the normal microbiome, recognizes it as self, and uh, uses some of its metabolism. And we know that abnormal immune development occurs in animals uh, in which the microbiome has been depleted. Um, antibiotic exposure can lead to resistance in members of the normal microbiome that might not be a problem for the patient themselves, but an immunocompromised patient could get infection with that same strain. And the dysregulated metabolism that occurs when your microbiome is out of whack has been linked to a wide variety of diseases, including uh, obesity, diabetes, and increased uh, autoimmune and allergic diseases like asthma. So we kind of have these three interdependent uh, uh, concepts uh, that need to be discussed. Um, with antibiotics. You could think of access, uh, maximizing access for everybody without any conservation, without holding back any antibiotics, or uh, trying to uh, innovate, create new kinds of treatment modalities is gonna speed up resistance. Uh, in contrast, if we conserve antibiotics, that might constrain access, uh, especially in the developing world, uh, where they're very much needed with a high risk of infection and might undermine innovation. And if you just innovate uh, without access, it's not only unjust, uh, but it's potentially wasteful. We're in the midst still, uh, it's sad to uh, recognize of the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, a lot of people have pointed out that uh, the current pandemic is having a self-reinforcing uh, cycle with uh, the antibiotic resistance pandemic. And with so many patients in the ICU and on ventilators uh, with um, COVID, uh, that's really the breeding ground for the highest level of antibiotic resistance. Uh, and it turns out that um, at least three quarters of COVID-19 patients are receiving intravenous systemic antibiotics once they're admitted to the hospitals. And because they're on mechanical ventilators for a long time, they have a high risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia and sepsis. Plus, uh, because of the risk to the healthcare workers of such a contagious infection, uh, they're wearing their PPE, and the goal is not to uh, create too much contact with the patient's secretions for worry of spreading it to other healthcare workers and patients. And that mean, means that fewer diagnostics are being performed and antibiotics are being prescribed empirically or just to be safe. So I think it's very useful to think of antibiotic resistance as another looming uh, global uh, pandemic, and also to think of the similarities in the ethical issues uh, between AMR and COVID-19, uh, which is also a collective uh, action problem. Uh, you think about individual rights in the area of mask wearing and vaccines uh, with uh, enough people not participating, uh, the public health goals of the masses cannot be achieved. So I wanna wrap up uh, to mention uh, that in the last year or so and plowing through uh, the pandemic, uh, we have uh, developed a new initiative at UCSD campus-wide. Uh, it's headquartered in our division of um, host microbe systems and therapeutics uh, in the Department of Pediatrics, but has over 80 faculty members um, in all the major divisions of the university. Uh, we have a, um, a managing director, Erica Anderson, PhD, uh, who is uh, coordinating a lot of public outreach efforts, research initiatives. We secured a training grant for uh, physicians 
and scientists in the area of antimicrobial resistance research that we're very proud of. We're developing a master's course. And what we are is about all sorts of new ideas uh, to break uh, through uh, and provide new solutions for patients in the area of antibiotic resistance. And these include um, understanding the virulence of the pathogens and neutralizing that, uh, targeting the immune system to fortify it in defense against infection, uh, looking all over uh, for new chemical resources, applying a lot of big data technologies, uh, vaccine approaches, rethinking the whole testing uh, and diagnostic paradigm, and repurposing drugs uh, from other areas of medicine. Um, I can't highlight uh, all uh, 80 faculty or even mention any single faculty in detail, but some of the most interesting and unique aspects we have here are the fact that the ocean uh, covering three quarters of the world's surface is a treasure trove of novel chemical discovery uh, from all the microbes and sediments. Uh, and we are uh, uncovering uh, entire new genera of microbes that produce uh, diverse antibiotic molecules and immune boosting molecules uh, that can be exploited uh, as new uh, discovery. Also, uh, the medical school is immediately adjacent to the basic uh, department of biology where uh, many of our best scientists are working in other um, animal models uh, such as uh, worms and flies and zebrafish where you can do very high throughput detailed genetic analysis of both the pathogen and the host in real time and this is leading to exciting new uh, insights, including the use of CRISPR uh, genetics, this year's Nobel Prize winning technology to address uh, resistant strains. We have uh, amazing chemists, both in the Department of Chemistry and uh, Biochemistry, as well as uh, our School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, uh, who have the ability to use uh, computer-aided uh, drug design, uh, as well as innovative uh, chemical modifications and screening methods to get the most out of our current antibiotics and to take promising compounds and make them safer or improve their pharmaceutical principles. Uh, we also have an interest uh, not only in bacteria, uh, but in emerging viral pathogens uh, such as uh, COVID, of course, but also pandemic influenza, uh, uh, Zika virus, um, and parasitic infections, such as the uh, neglected diseases of the developing world and malaria. We've developed uh, the Center for Microbiome Innovation here, and uh, we work very closely with them uh, to consider how to develop antibiotics uh, that are uh, safer, uh, ways to treat infection without disturbing the normal microbiome, but also potential microbiome solutions involving probiotics or nutritional therapies that shape the microbiome in a way that makes it more resistant to infection. Um, with our School of Engineering, uh, we're applying uh, big data uh, we call that omics approaches like genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and, um, and, and analytical tools that fall under the category of systems biology, as well as engineering solutions uh, like nanoengineering, uh, new um, uh, molecules that are very good at um, uh, uh, using uh, the body's uh, natural uh, biology to, um, to fool pathogens and to absorb bacterial toxins in a way that benefits the host uh, without uh, requiring antibiotic exposure. Um, and we wanna really be smarter about understanding uh, the host-pathogen interaction. 
uh, bringing our analysis of antibiotic action into the patient uh, scenario using clinical data, uh, small animal models, and everything we think about, instead of just being a chemical in a test tube, is going to be focused on the interaction between the host and the pathogen. And I'll illustrate briefly how that has advantages. Another totally unique uh, thing about UCSD is uh, our development of the first phage therapy center in North America, IPATH, uh, which all happened uh, because of the incredibly dramatic and now the subject of a best-selling book and movie in production case of our professor, Tom Patterson, and his wife, uh, professor and dean, uh, Stephanie Strathdy, who, uh, when he suffered an essentially untreatable multidrug resistant gram-negative infection and found himself clinging to life in a coma, uh, brought a very innovative approach of using viruses known as bacteriophage that kill pathogens uh, to clear uh, this infection, which most thought was beyond hope. And now we're extending that beneficial therapy to other patients. So right now, um, when you evaluate antibiotics, or if you get an infection, in order to pick which antibiotics we use, uh, testing is done in the laboratory in bacteriologic auger, uh, which is basically made out of seaweed and a bunch of other ingredients that are just designed to help the bacteria grow quickly. But they have nothing to do with your body, which is where the infection is. And what we're finding is that analyzing infectious disease therapy in the true context of the body is uncovering all sorts of uh, forgotten antibiotics and new approaches to treatment. Because before the patient has even been to their doctor, their infection is already being treated by natural antibiotics uh, that the body makes. And we want to know how to leverage these natural antibiotics and pick drugs that synergize with our innate immune system rather than uh, work at odds with it. Here's a famous little video of an immune cell, the neutrophil in our blood, chasing down the bacteria that you see there in blue. And um, this is the evolutionary process uh, that we are trying to um, uh, capitalize upon. Our immune system has this fantastic ability to detect, hunt down, and capture and kill microbes. Yet our current uh, infectious disease therapy is done in a manner that is completely blind uh, to the immune system. And we just look in the laboratory uh, as to whether the bacteria is killed, this zone of clearing in the sensitive bacteria, or the bacteria is resistant, where it's uh, growing right up and touching the antibiotic disc uh, here. Uh, but we really should be thinking about antibiotic resistance in terms of the patient. Do they get better or do they get worse? If they're getting better, then it's sensitive. If they're getting worse, then it's resistant. And this is a new way of thinking about antibiotics towards personalized medicine, rather than the classical test tube antibiotic analysis, which I think is causing our, us to shoot ourselves in the foot. So in conclusion, I think that antibiotic, uh, their success over the decades has made the public at large, and doctors in particular, very complacent. We were so used to antibiotics being successful, but now we see increasing resistance strains, abandonment of the field by the drug companies, and now we're having very bad patient outcomes with highly resistant superbugs. And I wanna contrast that with the cancer doctors. Uh, in cancer, you never had the ability to become complacent. So many cancers have such poor outcomes that cancer doctors were always striving for new discoveries. 
And the hugest area of discovery has been in immunotherapy. Uh, many uh, cancers, uh, such as malignant, melan uh, uh, malignant melanoma and, um, and uh, uh, other types of leukemia, uh, have had dramatic improvements in outcomes on the basis of immunotherapies. Just think of Jimmy Carter, who had metastatic melanoma to the brain and is still working uh, in his mid-90s for Habitat to Humanity with a, a cancer that would have been untreatable just a few years earlier. And I think that by opening up our mind uh, to think about uh, the host and the pathogen, the immune system and the bug, then there's all sorts of new areas for discovery highlighted in yellow uh, beyond the classical test tube antibiotics that we have right now. So I'll thank everyone. I always have to thank my lab uh, who keeps me inspired in our own antibiotic resistance research. Uh, and, and please contact me uh, through UCSD or by Twitter. And with that, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. That was, that was outstanding. Now we do have several questions already, Victor, in the in the Q and A. Um, but I wanted to start with one sort of uh, big question that that's um, bugging me in a certain way. Uh, bug is no intended pun there. Um, so the magnitude of the antibiotic re antibiotic resistance crisis you noted is due to at least four different things. The first two are what you and your collaborators are are working on um, to try and search for better antibiotic approaches, which has not been going on because it hasn't been profitable, and to have new ideas, find new approaches to, to doing that. But the items that followed that, overprescribing, patients not finishing their prescriptions, widespread overuse in agriculture, poor infection control procedures in hospitals, all of these are human social issues that could go a long way to helping us reduce this, this issue. So you, you might have some thoughts on how we can solve those, but I didn't hear you mention that you have a team working on those ethical issues, uh, trying to find ways to do that. Do you have a, a team working on those kinds of questions? How do we solve those problems? Um, well, I think it's a, a very, very important issue and um, that uh, collective action, increased public awareness, which is actually happening, um, unfortunately, as problems become more common and people's own friends and family are touched, uh, awareness uh, is increased. Uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has made uh, many of us uh, who previously didn't work in the field uh, very interested and uh, gaining some true expertise in immunology and infectious diseases. Really, the individual, by taking ownership of uh, antibiotic uh, prescribing by knowledge that antibiotics are only effective against significant bacterial infections, many infections would go away on their own, and viral infections are not treated by the common antibacterial antibiotics. Uh, they will know not to uh, shop around physicians and push to get prescriptions. As a practicing pediatrician, I found it very common uh, for um, a parent to come in with their child basically saying, um, you know, he was pulling his ear. I think he has an ear infection. Augmentin is the antibiotic that works and basically demanding uh, a particular um, approach, uh, even though um, this infection might resolve on its own. Uh, and often the busy pediatrician may be trying to see 30, 40, 50 patients uh, that day, may not have the time to go through the much longer explanation uh, required to let them know that um, that maybe uh, careful observation is better. But I think an understanding that antibiotics have the significant side effects on your normal microbiome and that that can lead to other health problems 
and that uh, the um, you can lead to very vicious cycles is a big uh, issue. And uh, I've often uh, considered whether we should remind people that antibiotics are really a type of antimicrobial chemotherapy. Uh, they're a chemotherapy that kills cells that we want in our body, as well as the cancer. It kills the normal flora as well as the pathogen. And I think if doctors also had that kind of practice in education saying, well, um, we want to make sure this is a significant infection before we start chemotherapy, uh, that maybe uh, the um, patients would have a greater appreciation of the scarcity uh, of the resource and the importance of accurate uh, prescribing. Um, but it's organizations that have a role too. Uh, hospitals need to practice antibiotic uh, stewardship, and this becomes more and more difficult uh, in healthcare settings where it's mostly individual practitioners in uh, rural uh, settings where it's more challenging to standardize practice. Uh, antibiotic prescription guidelines from uh, agencies such as uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America, whose flagship journal Clinical Infectious Disease is edited out of UCSD now by Chip Schooley, uh, I think uh, is leading. So there are a lot of public resources, CDC, WHO, IDSA, that people can educate themselves uh, to protect themselves. Yeah, thank you. And, and, you know, it just occurs to me that there's a pretty good chance that the audience for a program like this one already knew those things about, about overprescribing and so on. And yet much of the population doesn't. And the answer may not be for the pediatrician to try and persuade their patient or the patient's parents about what to do, but that we need to think about something in our schools. I mean, when science is taught, wouldn't this be a great topic for learning about science? Um, and yeah, um, as far I as it's... I know, it's not in the curriculum for K through 12. If anybody knows to the contrary, that would be neat to know. And if it's not true, then maybe that's one thing that all of us can do is, is lobby for getting things like this into the curriculum. That is one aspect of charm in that we are doing um, beginning K through 12 outreach and an undergraduate organization uh, has partnered with us. They call themselves U Charm, and that is one of their uh, major focuses. And I think uh, also um, our master's course, uh, when we develop it, uh, will be available in uh, the most streamlined form, free to a worldwide participation. Okay, great, thanks. So I'm gonna to go to the questions from our participants. Um, and the first one I think is a, is a fair one to sort of turn the tables a bit. Somebody's asking, so, so on the other side of resistance, do human genetics evolve to adapt to superbugs? So what, what are the chances of us adapting to? That's a very good question. <laughs> I see Savannah has asked that question. Um, well, you know, antibiotic resistance is only as old as antibiotics uh, themselves. So human evolution uh, to antibiotic resistance, we may not have had enough generations uh, afloat for um, significant uh, selection to have occurred. But the question is, is very good uh, in terms of pathogenic microorganisms in general. Um, basically, the definition of a pathogen is that it has evolved resistance to our natural antibiotics uh, and therefore is able to spread in the body to produce disease. And this battle between a huge variety of potential pathogens in our environment and our own immune system is one of the most important selective forces in evolution. And many people believe, for example, that genetic diseases, such as sickle cell anemia, arose because the heterozygote form of the disease carrying one copy of the gene affords protection to the individual against malaria. 
Likewise, the most common genetic uh, disorder in uh, Caucasian populations, uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, produces a devastating lung disease as a homozygous genetic disease. The heterozygous condition could, uh, because it's uh, a disease that reduces secretion of fluid uh, through uh, the cell membrane, be protective in cases of severe diarrhea in the developing world, like cholera or uh, E. coli associated diarrhea, because they lose less fluid. Uh, so, so I think you're exactly right. Uh, and many of us are studying exactly that, how our immune systems are shaped by immunity and have even discovered that there's a number of polymorphic uh, genes where um, half of people have one allele and another half have the other allele and their susceptibility to infection is dramatically different uh, based on which one they have. Thank you. Okay, so um, rele relevant to this question of trying to deal with antibiotic resistance, um, one of the participants asked, are there, are there any thoughts on redesigning the crowded livestock concentrated animal feeding operations so that prophylactic antibiotics that are contributing so immensely to antibiotic resistance um, that are not given? Yeah, that's exactly what needs to uh, happen. Thanks, Tom, for your question. Um, basically, um, yeah, there have been initial measures which tried to uh, restrict usage of antibiotics in agriculture that were not firm enough. Uh, for example, they suggested that um, antibiotics are used because they've discovered often that uh, cattle and swine grow faster and reach market size faster if they're treated with antibiotics. And uh, that's the main uh, incentive uh, to use them for uh, accelerating growth uh, because of the profit incentive there. But uh, when uh, uh, laws were made, including in the state of California, to say that you can only give antibiotics uh, to treat sick animals, all of a sudden the diagnosis of various minor illnesses in animals uh, skyrocketed. So it needs to be more aggressive, but there are many examples of success. I think one country just along the way you asked the question is Denmark, which is actually one of the world's largest producers of uh, pigs uh, in terms of uh, agriculture they uh, dramatically changed their practices to essentially be raising pigs antibiotic-free uh, by uh, doing a number of measures, um, increasing um, uh, spacing, increasing ventilation, greater attention to uh, hygiene within uh, the facilities, but also interesting things like allowing the piglets to stay with their mother for an extended period of time, uh, that uh, additional uh, breast milk and uh, maternal interaction fortified their immune system so that infections went down and antibiotic use was no longer needed. And these things uh, have led to significant uh, reductions in uh, MRSA infections in the population. So we see rates that are quite a bit lower, five to 10 times lower of certain types of drug resistant infection in countries like uh, Denmark and the Netherlands that have been much more aggressive in this regard. So there are models for the US uh, to follow and it is a cornerstone of uh, any successful long-term antibiotic uh, uh, preservation strategy. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Um, so. Um, Tom asked another question, which is, aren't there improvements in recent trends in antibiotic prescribing in the primary care setting because of the increased awareness of antibiotic stewardship? So aren't there already things moving in that direction? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think there's um, 
mixed success and there's not been uh, any comprehensive national um, assessment of the overall effectiveness. Many, many hospitals have instituted uh, programs for antibiotic stewardship. It's actually a new specialty within the practice of infectious disease that um, uh, young uh, professionals can train in and become uh, experts in, uh, but it's always at odds with other factors uh, like pricing of antibiotics and uh, trying to make sure that your hospital maintains a reputation for, um, you know, uh, prompt and aggressive uh, 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 boutique uh, uh, individual care uh, that, that pose some challenges. And I think uh, Arnold in the chat has pointed out that use of unnecessary antibiotics uh, has not really decreased on a significant level with the CDC program. So our success to date uh, has been patchy. Um, why this has failed is uh, I think uh, just a, um, uh, you know, a lack in the ambition of the program. In recent years, uh, the CDC has not been uh, forwarded as um, uh, you know, a, a bellwether of um, you know information that we all must follow, and science is always battling uh, politics and um, and financial uh, interests, which include uh, uh, potentially um, uh, companies trying to get every last dollar from their uh, existing antibiotics. Uh, so I think um, the mixed success uh, raises concern uh, for the future of antibiotic resistance. I mean, you need consistent success and you need uh, like uh, uh, herd immunity, um, uh, basically, you know, having good antibiotic practice in Southern California alone uh, will not help us if uh, neighboring states are uh, radically overprescribing uh, the antibiotics. Not saying that we're doing better, just using a geographic example that um, that things need to occur on a national level, as we learned with the, you know, COVID uh, response. Um, a patchwork of uh, solutions is not a penetrant enough. Um, approach to to solve this, um, uh, but main, you know mainly you have to ask uh, people. Uh, you know, do antibiotics work against a cold? You still have uh, frighteningly large uh, number of people who believe that to be the case, as well as uh, a large number of people and even some doctors who don't really consider much downside to antibiotics. You know, antibiotics are prescribed in a manner like, just to be safe, let's give you antibiotics. So we need to emphasize, um, not so much on, you know, I, I think we're gonna be more effective uh, by highlighting the short-term impacts. Uh, this could harm your friends and family. This could harm your microbiome and lead to other health problems than necessarily uh, talking about future generations because you've seen how easy it has been for us to neglect uh, the debt, uh, to divorce ourselves from uh, behaviors that uh, promote global warming, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, if I've just heard you correctly, it's actually it sounds pretty depressing. So um, it sounds like you were saying the CDC has not been good at giving uniform uh, helpful guidance. That well, I think it's just a, it's just the the program is not at scale to the problem. Yeah. You know, there's there's a website, uh, there's some resources that are available to physicians, but there's not a commercial during the middle of the Super Bowl uh, telling you what uh, you know antibiotic resistance is and how we need to 
work together to do that. Um, uh, we need, uh, there are some very uh, well-motivated uh, senators and congressmen uh, who are pushing through legislation focused on uh, innovation and ed education. I think it ha it's one of the rare issues that actually has uh, quite you know, bipartisan uh, support, uh, but it needs to be rolled out at a scale where uh, everyone understands it. And your earlier suggestion of uh, introducing education on this issue, which is really a great way to learn about evolution, provided your school allows education and evolution, uh, is uh, would be fantastic uh, for everyone to have a, a great appreciation of this at the at the early point. The superbugs are in part our own making, um, not uh, just um, nefarious uh, creatures that that came from outer space or somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. No, and and to be clear, I wasn't saying that you were particularly targeting the CDC, but it's part of a picture that includes what we're getting from on high, um, what physicians are doing and feel they need to do with their patients coming to the door, what the patients are asking for. And then you look at that entire picture, and it's not just a question of neighboring states. As we know from COVID-19 and as we knew before, Bugs, viruses, bacteria don't care about international borders. So if we're not doing, even if we're doing great and our neighbors aren't doing well, and our neighbors now are the entire planet, then we are all at risk. So there's a, there's a, I, I think it just means there's a very big job ahead of us to deal with these issues. It does raise a, a question, though, that came to mind here. So given the border question that if we do a good job and our neighbors don't, we're still in trouble. Is it still useful for us to do a good job? Um, I hate to ask that question, but I think yeah, that's yeah. no, there's uh, it's a um, you know it, it's a uh, gradation of benefit, right? Um, you can uh, you know if you reduce car you know uh, carbon emissions um, locally, there's a lot of benefits in terms of. Uh, clean air and health outcomes, uh, and um, perhaps your local climate will be less impacted, but it can't in and of itself stave uh, uh, global warming on a planetary level. I think um, that, um, it, you know, it really is incumbent upon uh, the the wealthy countries to really understand that um, uh, antibiotic uh, effectiveness and best practices need to be extended uh, into the developing world, and they need uh, the resources both for education and access to classes of antibiotics that can allow them to be successful really most importantly successful in treating infections because uh, the number of successfully cured infections uh, is one of the best ways to reduce overall antibiotic exposure, which is one of the reasons that what we're trying to do in CHARM is uh, bring in a lot of different perspectives like engineers, uh, the marine scientists, the systems biologists uh, into the field of antibiotic resistance for the first time uh, really break the mold, think outside the box, and come up with ways to fortify our immune system, to fortify our microbiome, uh, to use smart, targeted, personal therapy that does not select for resistance, and uh, only by bringing in new methods of treating serious infections, I think, are we going to really start to turn the corner on antibiotic resistance. Because simple chemical antibiotics, all of them select for resistance. If you use a, a antibiotic in a significant manner, there'll be resistant strains emerging uh, within the first several months of its clinical application. And if you use it widely, 
significant resistance, usually within a couple of years. So that is a sure bet. Uh, resistance, if you keep using the mold uh, that we have used to date. So entirely new ways of treating infection that can be work with antibiotics to make shorter courses or more tailored courses of antibiotics successful to make reinfection less likely to detect the cause of infection earlier so appropriate antibiotics can be instituted rather than using empiric broad spectrum antibiotics that's really where the giant uptick in success and a new era of infectious disease medicine beyond antibiotics, uh, I think is where I see optimism. You know, just like we revolutionized cancer therapy in my analogy. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Um, so um, until we get to that point, <laughs> Um, while we're working towards that. So Mark asked a, a question about um, personal autonomy and balancing that against the collective good. Uh, it's a, it's a, an interesting question. It said, should the public be engaged in actually weighing the issues to come to consensus? And how might this be achieved? I mean, so, I mean, you know, it's one thing to say, um, you, in America especially, you have the right to do whatever you want. It's another thing to say, at certain points, that right has to be limited. Um, you know, I think most of us can agree that having the right to do whatever you want doesn't mean you can run through a red light whenever you want. There are things that we choose not to do. So how do we have that conversation? Any thoughts on how we can? Well, I think you're, you know, Mark, uh, who I know personally is a very <laughs> um, uh, perceptive uh, uh, physician. Um, I think that um, it's exactly the issue, you know, it, uh, our country has become so politicized and polarized that uh, people uh, take positions in part just to be contrary, you know, contrary to science because a distrust of science globally is useful to them politically. And since antibiotics and you know, medical innovation come under the rubric of science, uh, they are collateral damage. Uh, same thing with you know, doctor's advice or public health officials' advice. Uh, it was attacked for no good reason, uh, even though um, uh, people do many other behaviors uh, like uh, wear a seatbelt, like carry auto insurance, uh, that are done um, uh, by law with, you know, very little, um, uh, you know, public backlash against the overall concept, uh, you know, going through uh, the um, uh, safety at TSA as you enter the airport. Um, uh, we just in a hypercharged environment right now uh, where um, uh, if it's smarty pants doctors or public health PhDs telling you to do something, even your own logic, your own personal intuition or what you would want for your own family um, gets superseded. So um, that is a very, very a uh, challenging issue to move uh, beyond that, you know, to get enough vaccination for COVID uh, to achieve um, uh, protection to stave off the expected hypertransmission of the new variants. I'm not confident uh, that we can achieve it uh, largely because of a tremendous amount of disinformation that didn't exist 20 years ago in terms of, you know, the level of vaccine compliance uh, that we saw. Uh, and um, and uh, it's almost uh, like a badge of honor or a proof of allegiance to an ideology uh, that, you, that you need to um, question authority, question um, 
uh, science. Um, I think um, the current administration, by in reintroducing the science advisor to a cabinet level position, uh, just by who they put on a number of their task forces and as Surgeon General, uh, looks like uh, they want to return uh, to a state uh, that uh, led to a, a global antibiotic uh, resistance initiative in the Obama administration. Uh, but it's on a playing field uh, that has changed uh, dramatically. And if um, a person of the opposite party is strongly recommending something, uh, people come in with a preconception bias and are probably only looking at one source of media uh, and social media uh, to just reinforce uh, their initial conception. That's the only thing they would click on, you know, the article that that tells them what they want to hear. Okay, thanks. Um, Sorry, um, Mark. Another question that's very similar. Are you looking at Arnie's question? So, um, so, uh, so I think I incorporated uh, Arnie's into it. Yeah, you pretty, pretty much pretty much answered that. But I I think it's you know one aspect of it is is to note that regimes that are much more top down than our country is um, have the the luxury or the disadvantage, depending how you look at it, to be able to say this is what everybody has to do for the common good. Um, and you know, I, I don't know whether there's anything you want to add on on that. No, now. I, I think it's a, it's it. a very important point. I you know I've traveled um, quite a bit uh, to Asia uh, related to um, our research and collaborations and. Um, you know, w one thing I noticed, of course, uh, in uh, Taiwan and Korea and Japan uh, during winters uh, for many years uh, was uh, considerable wearing of masks. And, um, and they're wearing masks as a courtesy. You know, if you're uh, sniffling and sneezing and, um, uh, you know, have secretions uh, coming out, it's you know you would not want to expose other individuals to that that's the main reason and in part they these practices were reinforced by their earlier experience with SARS and bird flu pandemics uh, that began to spread in their countries creating alarm similar to what we had with COVID and then um uh, it became a more long-standing practice. I have a little bit of optimism that, uh, you know, if another pandemic uh, began to brew uh, five years, 10 years in the future, and we started to identify cases, that we would take it a lot more seriously and act in a lot more organized fashion just because of the economic devastation, disruption of life that COVID-19 created for us. But the America has a very unique uh, frontiersman-like personality that emphasizes uh, this autonomy, um, even when illogical. You know, it's, um, you know, many of us work in the healthcare setting, you know, they have masks on all day if you're a surgeon doesn't really impair what you do. You know, it's really not that hard. Uh, but people acting like this is a, a dramatic um, evidence of uh, sheep-like behavior um, uh, of the public, you know, following the public uh, uh, health authority recommendations, uh, themselves revealing the most sheep-like behavior because their anti-masking and other things are so predictable, you know, in the way they evolve. So I, you know, I think, uh, um, you know, it's a very, very uh, tricky thing. There's also money to be made in disinformation um, because we have this uh, philosophy of, you know, kind of presenting people with both sides of the issue, even if one side of the issue is based in science and fact and the other isn't, you know, it makes for good television or makes the 
you know, whatever the media entity feel that they're doing the right thing by showing both perspectives, but they shouldn't be showing a perspective uh, that has no scientific basis and is harmful to the public health, but it never, you know, it nevertheless gets an audience and there is um, money to be made if you're a successful at articulating uh, a counter position, especially those that just tell people that they don't need to worry about stuff or uh, here's an easy way to deal with stuff or you don't have to change anything you're doing. The same reason that, you know, fad diets and, you know, all sorts of other things work. Uh, anything that says you can achieve a difficult goal of improvement, whether societal or individual, really easy, there's a big market for it. And that uh, is not, uh, you know, there's no real easy solution to antibiotic resistance uh, or global warming or other things. It's going to take pain. It's going to take sacrifice and collective action. Um, and, um, and, uh, that creates opportunities for, for other narratives and, uh, those can easily be funded. Yeah. So, uh, part of what's going through my mind right now is that what you've just described again, comes back to this divide that you almost have to choose in a, um, a faith-based approach to one side or the other and you believe that no matter what. And I, and I have, to, have to say that one of the things that's hard here is to recognize that it isn't so much that one side believes in science and the other doesn't believe in science. It, it's a matter of uh, both sides are going to believe in the science that's consistent with what they believe. Now, I'm prepared to, you know, to, to hear the argument that one of those two sides is, is right more of the time than not. But the fact is that it's not that, um, for example, people who oppose use wearing masks um, would didn't believe when the sun was, when, when we're going to have an eclipse and it was predicted by scientists. They believed it because they believed the science because that didn't interfere with, with the world view. So all this comes back to the question of what we should do. We talked a little bit earlier about education. Mark has proposed a solution about having movies directed at the lay public as a potential model for reversing distrust of science. In today's context, we might think that that question is about, you know, specifically antibiotic resistance, but maybe there's something more fundamental here about helping people to understand science as a way of thinking separate from our knee-jerk faith issues in, in one side or another. Any thoughts um, about something? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we are debuting uh, a movie uh, next uh, week uh, that is targeted uh, for uh, the general audience to use personal testimonials uh, as a way of increasing awareness, um, getting people to recognize the seriousness and immediacy of the problem, but also providing hope that there's a lot of smart people um, really willing uh, to uh, get involved and work in this. A lot of other things can be done by targeted investment, right? You know, um, the issue of we can appropriately treat people with antibiotics that might come at a, that may require a new antibiotic to be made uh, and for it to be reserved only for uh, the most resistant cases in order to preserve its length of utility, right? The drug company is not in favor of that only because there's no financial incentive to it. But if the government made a call for new antibiotics to be developed and said, we're going to cost share the most expensive stages of clinical development, and this antibiotic will be put in reserve and uh, you will benefit by having a longer patent or uh, we will give, you know, 
you vouchers where you can get rap more rapid review of your other drugs. There's all sorts of what we would um, call pull incentives that could be contemplated uh, to uh, mitigate uh, the financial downside of investing in antibiotics for a company. Um, but we really have to work on those because a few companies have successfully developed an approved antibiotic and because of the lack of those coordinated uh, in, uh, incentives, uh, they never found a market and they've even gone bankrupt after developing a successful antibiotic that got approved by the Food and Drug Administration. So um, uh, I think that, that governments can act uh, smartly uh, to create a, um, uh, a cohort of new antibiotics uh, that are basically uh, like Fort Knox, you know, where you have some gold in reserve um, uh, with investment. Um, I think that that would be a smart idea. Interesting. Yeah. So um, we have time for maybe one more question. And, and, and we didn't get in as, as much into some of the issues about low and middle income countries, but I think there's a really big and important issue that you raised, which is that the lack of antibiotic access in low and middle income countries is a bigger problem than the, anti, the, the resistance that we are seeing um, in this country and in other places, in other high income countries. So um, do you have any thoughts or do you know if people are giving some thought to how we balance that issue? I mean, is this the rich world problem <laughs> that we're addressing here? Um... Yeah, no, I think, you know, you pointed, I mean, you can make philosophical arguments on, on you know, both sides of the issue in one sense, um, you know, kind of a, a, a philosophy of duty, you know, uh, would say that you need to, um, you know, provide the best care for the sick, but that comes at odds with a... Uh, philosophy of preservation. In the developing world setting, um, you could uh, say that, um, you know, we have a philosophy of like a teleological philosophy that what is the purpose of antibiotics? The purpose of antibiotics should be to save the most lives. So we should design a strategy based on, you know, we need access to these antibiotics, we need to reserve a subset of them over the long term. But that comes at odds with a philosophy that might say, um, you know, the individual has a right to health care, the best health care that they can get. Um, so um, I believe that, uh, you know, that governments can buy into long term strategy if you pair access to antibiotics with standards uh, for their usage. Um, and it could be that um, drug companies could uh, be um, uh, rewarded um, with uh, certain things that are relevant to their use, the use of their drugs in the developed world and high market uh, value if they provide uh, the resource at uh, accessible or no cost uh, for use in the developing world. And there's a lot of models in vaccine development, including with the COVID-19 distribution along those lines. I want to thank you, Victor, for a really interesting topic. And it seems remarkable to me in this domain where I talk to people who are working on new developments, new technologies, and then asking about ethical questions. It seems remarkable to me how much effort and thought you've put into those ethical questions along the way. Um, I, I, we can only hope that more scientists and engineers would do the same. So thank you for, for your presentation this evening. Right, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody can contact me very easily at UCSD or connect with Charm. Our website will be coming up soon, but right now we're on uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and LinkedIn. Okay. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Mm -hmm.